Romans in its historical context. And understanding that what Paul is not doing in Romans is talking about our personal, individual salvation. That what Paul is doing in Romans is talking about the way God has redeemed the entire human species. And that the emphasis of Romans is not about us having faith and being justified and being put in the right with God, but God being just to forgive everyone freely. Now I'm going to show you that today. So the second week, what I did last week for, was to show you that the new paradigm argues that there are two voices in Romans. And I've done this with you in Galatians, we could do it in the Corinthian letters, where you have the voice of the false teacher and the voice of Paul. And so some folks, when they read Paul's letters, they really do think that Paul is of a double mind because sometimes he says one thing and sometimes he seems to say another thing. When in reality, we just simply have to learn to distinguish the voices. And I showed you how that's an ancient rhetorical technique that Paul is using that would have been familiar to Paul, to his hearers, and to the person whom he said to read the letter to the house churches. And how that person, in reading the letter to the Romans, would do a change of a voice, a different tone, a different inflection. So when they're doing Paul, they might use a voice that says, um, for the rectification of God is revealed from heaven, from faith to faith. But the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. You see, you have these two voices, and the lecture would change voice when they were, they were doing the false teaching. Now, we're going to skip chapter 4. Just, we just don't have time for this. But basically in chapter 4, Paul's arguing that if you want an example from the Jewish scriptures, <laughs> of how a person is rectified before God, it has to do with trust. And that's why Paul uses Abraham as his big example in chapter 4. So we're going to look at a text in chapter 3 where Paul will first articulate his understanding of the gospel. That is, up until this time, with the exception of Romans 1, 16 and 17, this whole time from 118 clear down to 320, Paul has been engaged in a diatribe with the false teacher. Now, what is this? There we go. Oh, that was what probably was. What, what Paul's engaged with here is now his own thinking on the subject. So we're going to launch right into Romans 3. This is the Common English Bible translation. All of my corrections to that translation, and they're not infallible, but they are, I can justify every one of them are in the kind of brownish text. Simply read it to you. But now, God's rectification, the way God makes a right relationship. So when I use the word rectification, I'm intentionally following Richard K. Moore's 1387 three volume set that exhaustively analyzes the best possible English translations to use and stays entirely away from the word justification, which in its Latin roots is a legal metaphor, and argues that dikaiosune or dikaio in Greek should be uh, understood in terms of right relationship, how God makes a right relationship. That's rectification. So when you see rectification, think right relationship, and I'll sometimes translate it that way even though you'll see it. But now, God's way of making right relationships has been manifested apart from the law. This is huge. Which is confirmed by the law and the prophets. In other words, he begins by saying there is a way of God making a right relationship that has nothing to do with the Torah. Now remember, you're the false teacher. You're teaching people that they need to follow the Torah. Be circumcised, have kosher table, Honor the Sabbath at minimum, at minimum. And Paul says there's a way that God enters into right relationship apart from this. And Paul now comes back with a big zinger to the false teacher. And this is borne witness to or confirmed by the law and the prophets. That is Paul saying, the way I'm arguing using the Old Testament comes from the Old Testament. That's what Paul's saying. God's rectification comes through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ for all who trust this. There's no distinction between whether you're a Jew or whether you're a non-Jew. All have sinned. Remember we saw this was the logic of chapter 2 and 3. 
The, the false teacher wants to say the Gentiles are sinners. We Jews have no law. And Paul has to work through this whole, this diatribing and this catena of texts in chapter 3 to say, all have sinned. Everybody, Jew and Gentile, lawkeeper and lawbreaker, all have sinned and come short of God's glory, but all are treated as rectified freely by His grace through Jesus Christ's redemptive act. Through His faithfulness, God publicly displayed Jesus as the one put forth as a means of showing His mercy, where mercy is found by means of His blood. He did this to demonstrate His being in the right to pass over sins that happened before, during the time of God's patient tolerance. He also did this to demonstrate that he is right in the present time, with the result that God might both be right and rectifier of Jesus' faithfulness. So I've, uh, th this is my particular translation of this text that contains a number of uh, themes that we'll move through next. When you look at the text this way, it reads a straight prose. What you can see if you read it in Greek is that Paul is quoting a tradition. And that tradition has a structure. And you can see exactly where Paul has added to that structure, that traditional structure. So I'm about to show you how this text looks when it's laid out in a chiastic pattern. And I'm going to show you what Paul adds. You'll notice that your A and your A prime, that's the A with the slash on it at the bottom, your B and your B prime, C, C prime, this is the text as it's laid out in a chiastic fashion. The center of the text, by Christ Jesus, God displayed Jesus. The focus of the text is on God's initiative, not our response. The gospel is not about us. I said this last week. It's about God. It's about the character of God. And if we get that straight, then we can talk about us, which we'll do in just a moment here. But you'll notice, for example, A and A prime both have this business of sinning. But the A prime refers to the, that you have all of sin and fall short of God's glory, but God has passed over all these sins. Your B and your B prime both have the word rectified. Your C and your C prime, by His grace, by means of His blood, are parallel clauses. Your D and your D prime, apolutrosis, that's the word for redemption, and helasterion, which we're going to deal with in a moment, are synonymous. But the heart of the structure is the focus on God. Man. This stuff just keeps popping up all this okay. weird stuff. There we go. Go back one, please. Hello, Earth to you. Back. There we go. <laughs> Do you understand this? These texts have structure. And Paul has added the E and the E prime in here. The, the rest of this you could take from Jewish Christianity. But Paul is about to do something huge. He's about to completely subvert the Jewish Christian understanding of atonement and the death of Jesus. There is the word in 323. God has set forth Jesus as a, 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 a helisterium. And some of your translations are going to read propitiation if you have a King James. Some of your translations, if you have a Revised Standard, are going to read expiation. Some of your translations, if you have a New International Version, are going to read place of atonement. There's a big difference in each of these. To propitiate God is to appease the wrath of God. Instead, Jesus is a sacrifice that appeases the wrath of God. To propitiate the gods is to make sure that they don't get all ticked off at you. To expiate means to remove sin. Big difference between propitiating an angry deity and just simply removing sin. The third alternative is that helasterion, which translates the word kapareth in Hebrew, 
refers to the Ark of the Covenant, that is the place where God displays God's mercy. So in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, Elasterion is the term used, for example, in these Exodus and Leviticus texts to refer to the Ark of the Covenant, where God shows mercy when the blood, of course, is sprinkled on it. You also need to know that it's possible that this term is a cognate of the Greek word hilaskistai, which means to expiate sin. The problem here, as we'll point out in a minute, is that expiation is something humans do. Humans remove sin by placing it on another. To expiate sin is to take your sin and place it on another, a scapegoat, a bird, a sin offering. You with me on this? You've placed it on another, and now your sins are removed. They're expiated, you're cleansed. You've taken the unclean, put it on another, and they're sacrificed and you're clean. But in Second Temple Judaism, there's also the possibility that this refers to the giving of your life for the sake of God. In 4th Maccabees, chapter 17, 22, there's a reference to the Jewish martyrs of 1st Maccabees, who became a ransom for the sins of the nation and through the blood of those righteous ones and their expiatory death, that the divine providence delivered Israel. No matter how you slice it or dice it at this point, what is essential is to recognize that in this text, Paul is intentionally calling to mind the Jewish sacrificial system. That's really the key here. There's something happening. There's something going on here that relates to this business of the Father, the Son, the human species. Now what Paul's about to do in this text is undermine the concept of sacrifice. Because on the cross for Paul, Jesus did not sacrifice himself to the Father. On the cross, God does not need Jesus to die. I will say this, the Father never wanted the Son to die. The Father is not a dealer in death. The Father is a life giver. Jesus never wanted to die. You do not need Jesus' death in order to get a pass into heaven. That's the, the sacrificial way of thinking that Paul's going to argue against. How does he do this? First, he notes that it is God who initiates the sacrificial experience or process. God gives God's Son. The Father gives the Son. Or in the language of Romans 8, the Father sends the Son. It is the Father who makes the offering to humanity, not the other way around. We are not offering Jesus to God when we crucify Him, nor is Jesus offering Himself to God as though the Father needed to be appeased. No, we have a sacrificial apparatus. And the only way into our religious way of thinking, what we want to call an economy of exchange, I give in order to receive. So I'm going to sacrifice this to the gods to get this blessing. Or I'm going to do these laws so I can get this blessing. That's the sacrificial way of thinking. If I do this, then I get this. Paul's going to subvert that in several ways. First, he's going to say that the sacrificial process does not take place in secret, in the Holy of Holies, behind a great big veil that one man gets to go into once a year. He says, God put forth Jesus publicly. So that's already the first indication that something is different about this business. Sacrifice takes place in secret. God exposes that by displaying Jesus publicly. Second, it's not humanity making an offering to God. It's God making an offering to us. While we were yet enemies of God. Not that God perceived us as enemies, but that we perceived God as the enemy. When we perceived God as the enemy, 
that God comes to us and says, here's my son. You need a sacrifice? Here it is. Go ahead, kill him, cover yourself in his blood, because his blood is now going to do something entirely different than all other blood. His blood is going to cry out for mercy. So when we nail the nails into Jesus' hands, this, this is my kind of paraphrase of Paul, when we bang the crown of thorns into his head, when we persecute him and torture him and hate him and despise him and cover ourselves in his blood, you've got to think of some Hollywood serial killer movie here. You, know? you really need to think this. This is an incredibly violent text. That's the heart of the Bible is the problem of violence. The heart of the gospel is the problem of violence. And if you had a Baptist, you'd be jumping up and down for joy right now. You really should. Because Paul's dealing with the crucial issue. The problem of violence. And what happens when you have a violent God? So Paul's saying God's not this way. God has publicly set Jesus forth as the place where mercy is shown. God is saying, kill me and I will not seek retribution. The buck stops here. No more retribution. The cross is the end of all theologies of retribution, all concepts of penal substitutionary atonement, all doctrines of eternal conscious torment and annihilation, all views that God is violent and retributive or now he's going to rain some kind of judgment down on America because SCOTUS declared gay marriage legal. I don't know if you've been listening to all the fundamentalists out there. I put a thing on my Facebook. I said, I wouldn't want to be a pulpit in a Christian church this Sunday morning. They're going to take a beating. Anybody know a good carpenter? <laughs> the point of the gospel is that God has come into our religious mechanism, the one we've created, the one we need, this whole system of sacrifice to appease the gods, and he subverted it and broken it and deconstructed it and said, look, there's an entirely new way of living and being. Our Arnold Holtgren, in his book, Paul's Gospel Mission, says that if we translate Helosterio as whom God put forth as a means of displaying his mercy, that is, Jesus on the cross is God saying, hit me, hurt me, beat me, use me, abuse me, torture me, kill me, and I will not retaliate. I will bless those who curse me. I will love those who persecute me. I mean, there's a whole ethic here, folks, in this view of atonement. Do you see that? It's an Anabaptist ethic in an Anabaptist theory of the atonement. Do you see that? Okay. And he says, no interpreter has dared to propose this. And he doesn't even propose it. And I thought, it's brilliant. Why doesn't anybody want to say that God has put forth Jesus as a means of displaying his mercy? Because all the interpreters, the translators and interpreters out there are locked into this business of religion as a sacrificial economy of exchange. They cannot imagine that God is coming to subvert religious sacrificial practice, thinking, logic, and theology. They can't see it. That's exactly what Paul is saying. Let me give you two authors that do see it this way. The first is Mark Hyme in his book, Save from Sacrifice. God enters into the position of the victim of sacrifice, a position already defined by human practice. And God occupies it so as to be able to act from that place to reverse sacrifice and redeem us from it. What are we redeemed from? We are redeemed from the practice of sacrifice, religious sacrifice. Us them thinking, holiness codes, purity codes, zeal. All of the things you can think of that Christian fundamentalism is, is what we're delivered from. Or all the things you can think of that conservative evangelicalism is in its theology and ethics, that's what we're delivered from. Hallelujah! God steps forward in Jesus to be one sub subjected to the human practice of atonement and blood. The concept of blood sacrifice wasn't God's idea. You've heard me talk about Renee Girard's 
theory of religion and the origins of humanity and the scapegoating practice and sacrificial processes. I've been talking about that for 10 years here. God comes and enters into our religion. Or in another place, Mark High puts it this way. On the cross, Jesus did not enter God's justice machine. God and Christ entered ours. So to continue... God steps forward in Jesus to be one subject to the human practice of atonement of blood, not because that's God's preferred logic, or because this itself is even God's aim, but because this is the very site where human bondage and sin are enacted. That's powerful stuff. Now here's Bob Hamilton Kelly. He says, clearly, with regard to this Romans text, we are on the way to a radical reorientation of the understanding of the relationship between the death of Christ and the sacrificial categories of Judaism, which entails a restatement of the sense in which Christ's death can be called a sacrifice. How can you even begin to call Jesus' death a sacrifice like these other sacrificial practices and procedures in the ancient Near East? The major new element, Bob says, is that Paul inverts the traditional understanding of sacrifice to God as the offerer, not the receiver. And the scapegoat goes into the sacred precinct rather than out of it. Or he'll say, these inversions of the normal order of sacrifice mean it's not God who needs to be propitiated, but humanity. We're the angry ones. We're the violent ones. And not in the recesses of the sacred in some secret place, but in the full light of day this takes place, this exposure of what human violence and religion and sacrifice all one thing are, rather than moving away from the sphere of the sacred, the scapegoat moves into that sphere. And notice this. Rather than removing sin from the sphere of the sacred, God removes all those who have been imprisoned under the powers of violence there. What does Christianity do? It says the church is a sacred place. And we're going to purge all the sin from it. That's exactly the opposite of what the Apostle Paul's arguing. The church is the place where Christ comes into our sin and sinfulness. Not where we cast it out. Folks, that's gospel. That's good news. Because it's about God. The character of God. The kind of God we believe in. The kind of God that shows mercy because it's the character of God to be merciful, not to require sacrifice. But there's more. In chapter 5, 12 through 21, we'll begin looking at this text. Paul says in chapter 12, in the same way that sin entered the world through one person, and death came through sin, so death spread to all human beings with the result that all sin. Let's unpack this. I'm literally just going to unpack this whole text now. You notice you have in the same way. So there's going to be a comparison here that's going to occur. He says, sin came into the world through one person. And death came through sin. The result of sin is death. So death spread to all human beings with the result that all sin. Now Paul's making the same argument he made back in chapter 3 that he makes in chapters 1 through 3, all have sinned. That's all he's trying to do. And he's trying to do it now by saying, look, we can start with this Adam figure in Genesis. We can go to that story as a backstory. And what we have in Adam is representative of what we have of all humanity. Somebody who correlates sin and death in his own being. How does this happen? Although sin was in the world, look at this, since there was no law, it wasn't taken into account. Remember Paul in Romans 3.26, it just said, God had a time of patient forbearance. He just forgave, he freely forgave the people under the Torah. That's the compassion of God. The phrase that the common English Bible uses, it wasn't taken into account until the law came. The words until the law came are not in the Greek text. I have the Greek text up here for a reason, so anybody that reads Greek can see what I'm saying. 
this is where the translators want you to think that once the law came, God started taking sin into account. But Paul's not saying that. Your translations, friends, cannot be trusted. Don't know how to tell you this. They just can't. So, death, not sin. Notice this, not, not sin. Death ruled from Adam until Moses, when Torah came. Even over those who didn't sin in the same way Adam did. Adam was a type of the one who's to come. How? That's going to be the big question. Now, before we launch into that, I need to show you a big error that your evangelical friends make. Ready for this? Do you see in verse 12, it says, In the same way that sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all human beings. See the phrase, with the result that all sinned? See that word? Okay. Suppose you substitute the words, in whom all sinned. In other words, Adam is the one in whom we all sin. How many of you have heard that talk in your life? That we all sinned in Adam, right? That comes from the Latin Vulgate and the influence of Augustine, who did not read Greek, but only Latin. The uh, phrase here in Greek is epho. Unfortunately, Augustine had the Latin reading, which read in quo. That's how Jerome translated this phrase, epho. He translated in quo, in whom, not knowing that epho is an idiom that is causal and to be translated because. So, when you go back, if you say, death spread to all human beings, in whom all sinned, that is, in, because all sinned in Adam, that's very, very different than saying death spread to all human beings with the result that all ended up sinning. Very, very different. Whoops. Oh, now I'm going backwards, which way is forwards. That way. Now we move on. Paul says, but the free gift isn't like Adam's failure. Now we all know from Paul's perspective that when Adam took that misstep in the garden, it affected the entire human species. Death came. What kind of death? Did Adam die? Did Eve die? The word sin and the first death in the Bible are connected in Genesis 4. The word sin is not used in Genesis 3. It's used in Genesis 4, where God says to Cain, Sin is a croucher at your door. And then Cain kills Abel. Sin, death, over, over the issue of sacrifice. Who had the better sacrifice? Whose sacrifice pleased God? Whose didn't? The Genesis text is signaling us in every way that what we have to do is understand the relationship of sin to death, to sacrifice. Because God is going to subvert all of these on the cross. The free gift is not like Adam's failure. If all people died through what one person did wrong, and how many of you have been taught this? That when Adam fell, the whole human race fell. And we died. Paul says, okay, given that logic, Given that logic, if all people died through what one person did wrong, how much more? This is the second time in Romans he's used this, this rabbinic hermeneutic, call the Homer, light and heavy. If something applies to something light, it also applies to something heavy. If you being fathers know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will God give good gifts to you? If, as Paul says earlier in Romans 5, someone dares to die for a good person, how much more does it mean that Jesus died for those who perceive him as the enemy? So in the same way, if all people died through what one person did wrong, how much more will God's grace overabound for Mennonites, well, Baptists, Presbyterians, Calvinists, Catholics, um, Lutherans? No, 
What's it say? All. How much more will God's grace overabound? Perusing, overabound, overflow. It's like you're sitting there with your, your cup under the tap and it fills and it fills and then the sink starts filling. Overflows, really overflows for all people with the gift. That is, Jesus is the gift that comes from the grace of God. The gift is not like the consequence of one person's sin. If one person sins screwed it up for the whole species, God's gift in Jesus Christ just doesn't make that right. It makes it a million times better. The gift isn't like the consequence of one person's sin. The judgment, the expulsion from the garden that came from one person's sin led to condemnation. Not punishment. The common English Bible has punishment here. Greek has a term for punishment. Colossin. That's not the term that's used here. It's katakrima. The judgment that came from one person's sin led to condemnation. But the free gift that came out of an abundance of failures, same term, led to the verdict of acquittal. One man sins. The whole species is condemned. The whole species from Adam until Jesus commits multitudes, the millions and millions of sins, and God says, acquitted. How much more? How much more does what Jesus show of the Father's character and heart overabound what one man in a garden could do? He goes on, if death ruled because of one person's failure, are you afraid of dying, friends? Death is on the horizon for you know, all of us, right? I mean, it's there. And we get a little nervous about this death thing, or maybe like Ernst Becker, America's a culture that's in denial of death. Then we do everything we can to avoid death. We're afraid of death. Humans have always been afraid of dying. And, you know, people don't exactly go to the other side and come back every day, and that kind of thing. But if death rules, if death is king because of one person's failure, those who receive the overflowing grace and gift of rectification will reign in a life given fashion. I want to point out to you here, there's a very clear ethic implied for those who recognize that God on the cross is not being retributive, no penal substitution here, that God does not need Jesus' blood in order to be satisfied, that God sets forth Jesus as a display of absolute pure mercy. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Look at him. What you see in him, Paul says, is me not counting your sins against you. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 20. <coughs> Those who receive this overflowing grace will reign in a life-giving fashion. There's your Anabaptist ethic, folks. The common English Bible has will even more certainly rule in life, but there's nothing in the verb that indicates anything about certainty. And he moves on. So now, the life-giving rectifying requirements of the law, and let me focus you on this for a second. The common English Bible translates this as the righteous requirements necessary for life. That makes it sound as though there are things that you have to do that are righteous, that make you right, that are necessary for your life. I have a real problem with that translation. Because the Greek text isn't moving in that way, and it dispenses entirely with Paul's view of the law. It's as though everything Paul has set up to this point about the law doesn't count. What Paul is trying to say, as I said in my last series on Galatians last fall, and you'll remember this, there are two voices in the Torah. There's the voice of curse, and there's the voice of blessing. Paul says God and his work is to be identified only with the voice of blessing. God is not a cursing God. That's the burden of Galatians chapter 3. I, you can see that on, online. I have it on video. I did it, taught it here. The point is, Paul uses this phrase, dikaiomata, dik, uh, uh, for the righteous requirements of the law, referring to those parts of the law that bring life. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
Show hospitality. Be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. Those are the righteous requirements that are life-giving. They bring life. They give life. If you follow holiness codes, don't do this, don't do that, do this, do that, you are bringing death. That's all you're doing. And so when churches become legal institutions where their primary emphasis is on making laws, well, we're going to do this, we're not going to do that, we're going to let these people in, we're not going to let these people in, we're going to let some people do this, we're going to let some people do that. Or they create hierarchies where this happens. They've fallen back into the false teacher's way of thinking. For Paul, the so-called righteous requirements of the law are life-giving. If you want to know if you're doing God's will, just ask, is what I'm doing giving life? That's all you have to ask. If it's bringing judgment, condemnation, punishment, hatred, discrimination, bitterness, resentment, you know you're not. It's that simple. So he says, the life-giving, rectifying requirements, life-giving requirements that make for right relationships are met for everyone. Look at this. They're met for everyone through the righteous act of one person. Just as judgment fell on everyone through the failure of one person. All people were rectified through the obedience of one person. Just as many people were made sinners. Now I did that on purpose because in Greek what you have here is koi poloi. Literally, the many. Hebrew doesn't have a word for all, or Aramaic doesn't have a word for all. So in order to say all, when their translators translate this, they use the phrase the many, the multitudes, meaning all. This is the only term Paul ever uses throughout this text. The many, the many, meaning all. So all people were rectified through the obedience of one person. Is it just the Christians that are rectified, friends? Is it just those who follow Jesus? Those who get baptized? Those who go to church? Those who read their Bible? Does this rectification not include all of those we would prefer not to have sit in our pews? Yes or no? Does all mean all? Because if it does, if all means all, it means that we treat all people with the same exact ethic that God has demonstrated on the cross in Christ. Now the problem here, and I'm going to reverse this text for you, throughout this entire uh, Romans 5, Paul goes, Adam Christ, Adam Christ, Adam Christ, Adam Christ. And Christ is always the, how much more? But the translators, they can't handle this. So they reverse it. And, and so you, you, you have in this these two verses, for example, um, the life-giving requirements are met for everyone through the righteous act of one person, Christ, just as judgment fell on everyone through the failure of one person, Adam. All people were re rectified through the obedience of one person, Christ, just as many people were made sinners, Adam. So it goes, the translation to make it go, Christ, Adam, Christ, Adam. But in the Greek text, which is right there in front of your face, it's Adam, Christ, Adam, Christ. Paul's saying whatever Adam did, and accounted for the whole human race, we're all guilty, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Whatever Adam did that you want to say counts toward everybody, that makes it look bad, God has so abundantly overturned this. You can't begin to imagine how good it is and how good God is. That's the gospel from Paul's perspective. So, Paul has to make a statement. Why the law? And we'll get into this next week more. The law stepped in to amplify the failure. Pay attention. The purpose of the law was not to stop sin. All law does is create more sin. When you think about a Christian culture like America, 
The very same culture that claims to be a Christian culture, our fundamentalist evangelical friends out there, you know, we live in a Christian nation and all of this nonsense. What do they do? We are a nation of law and order. You can't say that. You can either say we're a Christian nation, in which case we follow Jesus, or we're a nation of law, in which case we follow the Jewish Christian and the false teacher. But you can't say both. The law steps in to amplify the failure. That's the function of law. If you want a church, if you want a church where you're going to start being able to distinguish holy people from unholy people, just start making laws. And you'll see who will follow them and who won't. And you stick with the ones that follow them and you get rid of the ones that don't. It's that simple. Put a bottom on your head. Shave your beard. Whatever. Paul says, but where sin increased, and it did, once you add law to the equation, sin increases. Grace multiplies even more. Do you see through this whole thing? Paul's saying, no matter how bad you think it is, or how much death and sin affect the human species, what God has done is to overturn this in abundance. How much more overflowing what Jesus did can't be compared to what Adam did. It's like comparing a molecule to a galaxy. Folks, sin and death, they're molecules. The work of Christ in showing us the merciful heart of the Father is the galaxy. And where do you want to focus the gospel? Do you want to focus it down here on the molecule? Why, well, it's about my faith and my doctrine and my church and, and my holiness. Or do you want to focus your gospel where Paul does on the character of the Father through the Son, by the Spirit? We don't need to be talking about ourselves anymore like we do Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. You're in and you're out. It's time to talk about God. That's what Paul is doing here. And so he says the result is that grace will rule through God's rectification leading to the life-giving age to come through Jesus Christ our Lord, just as sin ruled in death. Again, the translators get it all wrong. The sentence starts out, just as sin ruled in death. That's what it says up there in Greek. The law was added in order that sins might increase. And where sin increased, grace superabounded. I'm literally translating the Greek text here. In order that just as sin reigned in death, so also, and this is how the, the text ends, grace shall reign through rectification into life-giving ages through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul ends again on Christ, not sin. The emphasis is not sin, it's on Jesus. In the end, is, the emphasis is not on the effects of sin, it's on the work of God to deconstruct the effects of sin, and God will raise Jesus from the dead. And in raising Jesus from the dead, vindicates this entire position that God is only a God of mercy who does not require sacrifice to forgive sin. The problem with sacrifice, religious sacrifice, is that it's always tied to social sacrifice. That's why in the prophets, whenever they critique the temple, they also critique the social uh, thinking of the Israelites who marginalized widows and orphans and poor and lepers and others. And just like in our current culture, you have the same churches that place an emphasis on sacrifice and worship, sacrifice in the church, sacrifice in the Christian life, sacrifice of your tithes and offerings, sacrifice, 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 and they're the same churches that sacrifice gays and people of color and people of different classes and women and then marginalize them as though we were not all equal in the sight of God, all precious, all children, all of us, not some of us, all of us. That's the gospel. That's the good news. 
That's what Paul preaches. And so this section will end in the same way Romans 11 ends after Paul's dealt with this very bad doctrine of election of the false teacher. And Paul in Romans 11 says, God has placed all under disobedience in order that God might have mercy on all. Universal reconciliation. Universal salvation. What God does, God does for all. And that's the gospel that needs to be preached to every creature under the sun. What Jesus has done for you, He's done for everyone. And what He's done for everyone, He's done for you. Mm -hmm. Amen.